Now, we are continuing in our series called Survival Guide for the Soul. This is the fourth week of the series, and so if it's your first time here or first time watching online, uh, you're kind of in the middle of the movie. You can always catch up on our YouTube channel, but this is, this is kind of the question we're asking ourselves in this series is how do we survive inside? How do we survive some of the mental challenges, emotional challenges, those, those conflicts that are inside of us? How do we get through those things? And we're taking you know, survival-based principles that work in the wild and applying them to our lives and trying to figure out again, how do we make it through these challenges that we face? Now, I talked about this a couple weeks ago, but there is a TV show called Alone. I don't know if any of you watch that show. I think it's a cool, super interesting show, but here's, here's kind of the premise of the show. They take 10 contestants and they drop them off at these remote locations and just say, last one out wins. Okay. It's just, it is literally survival of the fittest. Um, but it's not like, you know, the, the show survivor, there's no challenges they can do. There's no meals they can win. There's no teammates or anything like that. It is just them all alone 24 seven, as long as they can possibly last. There's not even a camera crew there to film them. They are given cameras and they film themselves and the longest anybody has ever made it on the show is 100 days. That guy won a million bucks uh, watching the show. I'm not sure if that was worth it. But anyway, these, these 10 contestants, right, they get dropped off. And a majority of the seasons have been somewhere up in, you know, kind of Western Canada somewhere. And they always get dropped off about late fall, October, November time frame in anticipation of winter coming. And what I've noticed over watching all the seasons of the show, it's in its 10th season right now on the History Channel, what I've noticed is that there's this pattern that emerges in all the contestants. And there have been 100 contestants on the shows, uh, men and women, young, old, people from all over the world, people with different you know, specialties when it comes to survival wilderness, and yet every single time, all the contestants basically follow the same plan. They, they get a fire going, they build a shelter, and they find water. That's it. I mean, within the first day or two, everybody nails those essentials down. They want to make sure and get those basic things covered before they move on to anything else. And, you know, once people have been there 50, 60 days or whatever, then they get on to other things. Some people have built boats and rafts and one guy on there built like this little stringed ukulele looking instrument to keep himself kind of, you know, preoccupied mentally. But every contestant in every show, in every location they've been, and sometimes they're on a lake, sometimes they're in the mountains, there's this different geography and topography. They all do the exact same thing. Get a fire going, build a shelter, find some water. Sometimes they don't even worry about food for the first couple of days because they all know this. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. It, they have to get these essentials taken care of. The, the, the temperatures are going to drop. The snow is going to fall. The food sources that were readily available when they first got there are not going to be there later on. And in order for them to make it long term, if they want to win the money, they have to take care of the essentials first. And you and I were... We're not on some, you know, reality survival show, but there are some essentials for us to survive as well. Even just physically speaking, you know, we might not have to go foraging for food, but we all need food. We all need shelter. We, we need, unfortunately, we need money. Okay. It's, it's just a part of what it takes to live in our culture and our world today. Now, probably a lot less than we want or what we think, but it's, it's something that we need. We need in order to make it in our lives today, you know, we need a vehicle to be able to get to job or, you know, to get to the grocery store or take our kids to, you know, to school or whatever it might be. There are these, there are these, these basic needs. And I even think, you know, when you look at our culture and America in 2023, maybe even things like utilities, you know, electricity and, and some sort of phone and doesn't have to be the newest one, but internet, those, those are things that maybe not, might not keep us physically alive but they enable us to kind of stay alive in culture and make it through. And there, there are some just basic essentials that we need. But here's the thing about all those, all of those things, food, shelter, water, phone, you name it. 
Those are all things that take care of us on the outside. Those are essentials that kind of work with the external side of things. But what are the essentials we need in here? What is, what is the essential for peace? Have you ever stopped to ask that question? Sometimes I think we just burn through life so quick, we never, we never stop to really evaluate and discover, is there something that can give me peace on the inside? What, what are the essentials? What, what's kind of the foundational thing? Is there something foundational that can give us joy on the inside? How about, how about when you're feeling lonely or depressed or discouraged or, or all these sort of things? Is there, is there something that's more vital, more basic, more kind of ground level that can actually help us get through those things? Are there essentials to get us through some of those challenges? And, and here's where I think sometimes we get off track so easily because we are all going to face emotional and mental challenges. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. We're all going to come up against it. And when we run into those challenges, we need to have a plan. We need to address the essentials first. But I think what happens for us so often is that we blur the lines. We blur what we think is essential or what is essential on the outside. We think those are the same things that are going to be essential for the internal battles we face as well. We, we, we think that if we can just take care of everything on the outside, then we'll be good in here. And you've, you've probably run into this before, you've heard it, or may, I'm sure all of us have thought it. Okay, I'm not, I'm not really feeling satisfied on the inside. Okay, so what am I going to do? Well, I'll just go buy a new house. I'll just go buy a new car. Or I'll just get, you know, a, a better cabin on a nicer lake. That, that will make me feel satisfied, right? Some of us, we, we deal with fear. And when that fear starts to creep up, when we get worried or anxious about something, we think, okay, I know what to do. I know it's essential to get rid of my fear. I'm just going to preoccupy my mind with something else. I'm just going to buy something new. I'm going to go on a shopping spree or I'm going to watch more Netflix or I'm going to dive deep into this hobby so that I don't have to think about the fear. I can just, you know, kind of numb it and move on with life. I think many of us, we've felt before like, man, does my life have purpose? Does my life have meaning? And we think that in order to get those things. We think what's essential is, well, I don't, I don't feel fulfilled or have purpose. Well, I'll just get married and then I will. Or I'll just have kids and they, they'll give me purpose, right? Or maybe we've had kids that were like, well, that wasn't really doing it. So maybe I'll enroll them in everything, every sport, every activity, and I'll live through them. And maybe if we have enough trophies on the mantle, then maybe I'll feel good about myself. Or I'll, I'll lose some weight or I'll climb the the corporate ladder and culture has just shoved it down our throats. And we've all, okay, me too. We have all bought into this idea that if we can just get that pot of gold, whatever it is, we have different levels of shininess and different size pots we think we need. But if we can just achieve and accomplish and attain, we think that will make us good on the inside. When we struggle in here, what happens for every single one of us is we Look to solutions that are all out there. But here's the interesting part about that. We've all tried it, and it's failed us every single time. Maybe it works for a little while, but long term, anything on the outside never really fulfills us on the inside. I think celebrities are are great for the celebrities. I, I wish often celebrities weren't a thing, but I, th I think they do serve this incredible purpose in our lives that, that you have these multi-millionaire, multi-billionaire people with more resources, more wealth, in better shape, supermodel bodies, more opportunities. I mean, just more of everything. And yet they're still lonely. And they're still depressed. And they still get anxious. And they still feel this this sense this nagging inside like isn't there something more everything that we've tried on the outside has never once fulfilled us on the inside long term we keep searching we keep pursuing we think there are things if i just have my health if i just have my family if i just get this job if i just get this award 
then I'll be good in here. But we got to take a look in the mirror and say, that hasn't worked. It hasn't worked for any of us. And so if, if all those things that we think are essentials, in fact, aren't on the inside, then here's the question we have to ask. What is? What is the essential thing that we need for the struggles and the battles and the survival challenges that we face in here? Is there something that we can look to pursue that can actually do what we need in here? Now, Jesus talked about this often. I mean, most of what he talked about had to do with this, but there was one specific time where Jesus was teaching on a hillside and there are thousands of people around and and nobody brought lunch. Okay, I don't know if they forgot it or what, but Jesus is there and he does this incredible miracle. Maybe you've read about it or heard about it. Jesus feeds 5,000 people. Amazing. Holy cow. Everybody sees this miracle in front of them. They're like, Jesus, you're the one. This is awesome. Thank you so much for giving us food. Well, later that night, Jesus and his disciples get into a boat and they cross the lake. And the next morning when these thousands of people wake up, guess what? They're hungry again. And so they're thinking, where'd where'd Jesus go? This guy is like shooting sandwiches out of his hands. We need to find him, right? And so they they go around and they look and they find Jesus on the other side of the lake and and they ask him, hey, give us us more food. And, And, you know, to be fair, food was much more scarce back then than it, you know, is for us now. But Jesus responds to them with this. He says, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Instead, spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. Jesus looks at these people and he says, man, you're so, you're so concerned about these temporary things. This, this, this food that you want, yeah, maybe it's important, but it's not, it's not the necessity that you think it is. Jesus, as he's responding to them, is trying to get them to see beneath the surface that there's more than just physical needs. There's something else that he could offer them better than food. And they don't get it. You can can keep reading and they just keep asking, okay, but do you have food, okay? We hear what you're saying, but like we'd really like a foot long. Jesus, just give us food. Moses gave us food. Can't you give us food? And In John's, you know, as as John's writing, he doesn't write down all of Jesus' facial expressions, but I just, I picture Jesus going like this, like, oh, you people, holy moly. And he says this, I tell you the truth. Okay, listen up, people. I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Again, let's let's look a little deeper than what than what you think. Jesus said, Yeah, there's there's life on the outside, but there's also life on the inside. Why aren't you asking about this life on the inside? There is bread better than the bread I gave you for lunch yesterday. And they still don't get it. They keep asking. So you're saying there's bread from heaven. Can you send us that? He finally gets to this point. He just says, listen, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. These people, these thousands of people, and I think what happens for all people, so focused on the perishable things, so focused on the external things, so focused on things that are ultimately temporary that we miss what's most important. We miss what's most valuable. We miss what our most, how our most basic human need can be fulfilled. And Jesus says, listen, I can give you bread if you want, but I can give you something even better. I can give you life on the inside. That hunger, that thirst, that longing, that unsatisfaction, that discontentment, all of those things. He says, listen, I can fulfill you in a way that nothing else can even touch. I can satisfy those needs on the inside. 
And as you read the rest of what Jesus says in, in John chapter 6, when you look kind of everything Jesus said that we can read about, what we see is that Jesus was talking about a relationship with God that he was going to make possible. That through his death and resurrection, he was going to open the door, give access to anybody who would believe to experience this two-way relational connection with God. And that as a result of being reunited to God, we would experience life on the inside, this essential thing that we need. When Jesus said this, my, my father gives you bread from heaven and it leads to eternal life. Part of that, yes, is heaven and eternity, but it's also right now that, that he wasn't promising life, you know, like lifestyles of the rich and famous, but a rich life on the inside, fulfilled and complete. Every single one of us, we need nourishment and sustenance and energy, and he can provide that through our relationship with God on the inside where no bread or water or external anything can even touch. Jesus promised that a relationship with God was the essential thing that we needed. And this was more than just hyperbole. This was not just Jesus trying to make a point. This wasn't some fantasy world. This was real and it was available and Jesus was going to make it possible. And as we read throughout, you know, other, other people's lives in the New Testament, we see that their lives were transformed by doing, by leaning into what Jesus promised. The Apostle Paul is a great example of this. He's the one who wrote a majority of the, the letters and documents that we find in the New Testament. And in one of his letters, 2 Corinthians, Paul kind of goes through this pattern several times where he talks about a trouble he was facing, but then how his relationship with God made a difference in the midst of that trouble. At the beginning of 2 Corinthians, he writes this, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we actually expected to die. And we don't know exactly what this trouble is. It doesn't matter what it is. The thing that Paul was experiencing was this crushing, this overwhelming, this like, I don't know if I'm actually even going to make it through this. And some of us have been there before, haven't we? Some of us are there right now where we feel like, I don't, I don't even know if I can breathe. I feel so lonely, feel so disconnected, feel so whatever emotional thing is coming up. We feel like, yeah, I can identify with Paul said, I don't, I don't think I'm going to make it through this. Paul was there. He experienced those things, but he discovered something. How was Paul able to survive? He tells us, but as a result we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. We thought all these other things were important, but guess what we realized? It was only God that was going to make a difference where we needed it the most. In fact, just a few verses earlier than this, he writes this, God is our merciful father and the source, the essential, the vital, the foundational place of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our troubles. Paul was, was overwhelmed, was crushed, but he found what he needed most. He was able to survive, not because the circumstance changed, because he was changed on the inside, this relationship with God. He writes later on in chapter four, he describes almost the same sort of thing. He says, we're pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. Yeah, we're hunted down, but we're never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Paul, I think as he's writing here, when I kind of read this, I get the the picture, the thoughts like, okay, I feel this way, but the reality is this. My emotions are telling me I'm being crushed, but the reality is God is with me. My, my, my feelings, the mental battle, I'm perplexed, but I'm not perplexed so much that I'm in despair because I have this 
this connection with God. He was he was nourished on the inside. He was taken care of. He was sheltered through his relationship with God. Again, horrible situations, horrible circumstances on the outside. But inside, he made it because of this, this bread of life, this, this living water, this essential relationship with God. Even later on, towards the end of the letter, he says, listen, there was this time I had this thorn in my flesh. Again, no clue what it is, who cares? But he says, I begged God three times to take it away. Has there ever been a situation in your life where you begged God to change something? You beg God to change a situation, to bring a loved one back, to change a diagnosis, to, to provide in some sort of way, God, I need to tears in our eyes, begging you, Father, please change something out here so I can be good in here. That was Paul, this, this spiritual giant, oh, the great apostle Paul, man, he was the same as us. He experienced the same survival challenges on the inside that you and I do. But God told him, I know that's what you want, but my grace is all you need. My presence is all you need. It is, it's, it's me who can change you. It's me who can sustain you. It's me who can give you the life that you want, regardless of what happens on the outside. And I, I man, I just think like, the most essential thing that we can do in our lives is to build a relationship with God. Hands down, it is the most important, most crucial, most essential thing that we can do, but we overlook it so often. You know, it's, it's, it's not as urgent on any of our lists as I really think it ought to be, me, me included. And I just wonder like, how much better prepared would you and I be to survive the inevitable challenges we're going to face if we, had, if we would take time to build our relationship with God first? If we would take time, like all the contestants on the show alone, to cover, to get the essentials secured first, how much better would we be inside? Like, like what, what, if, what if rather than waiting to build a shelter, we grew in our relationship with God now. What if, what if rather than waiting for, okay, I need bread, I need water, I'm feeling this long inside. What if we'd already built up a, a storehouse, if you will, of this relationship with God, of knowing his presence or his voice or this, this connection with him that we can tap into when our other resources are low. Don't you think that would make a difference? Well, it, it, um, in, in a book called With, author Sky Jathani puts it this way. He says, it is the experiential knowledge of God's love. Not just up here, but experiencing that, his unyielding goodness towards us, that drives us from fear. When we live with God, when we are united with him and experience his goodness and love, fear loses its grip on our souls. Fear is an incredibly powerful, challenging thing that every one of us have to go through. But what if the next time we face fear, we feel anxious, we feel worried, what if God's love was not just something up here or something that we heard in a room or watched on a video, but what if it was actually like a a familiar part of our lives, a, f a familiar thing that we experienced often, that we knew, that we just knew, that we knew, that we knew, that we knew that God loved us. Don't you think that would change that? Yes, I might be afraid about this, but I know that, that God, God loves me. He takes care of me. He knows the number of hairs on my head. And no matter what happens, that doesn't change. Don't you think that would be an essential thing to help us get through that emotion. And Sky just talks about this in relation to fear, but this is true in so many different challenges that we face. Every one of us have been hurt by other people, by what they said, 
by what they did, by what they didn't say or didn't do. And when people hurt us, it, it, it causes wounds in us, you know? We carry around these wounds and this weight on our back, like we're carrying this heavy, you know, backpack with 100 pounds in it and we're, we're hurting, we don't know what to do. What if we could deal with that hurt better because we knew the comfort of God's presence? Like a salve on an open wound that's just like this, this refreshing comfort of, okay, I know that happened, but God, you comfort me. You are the source of comfort, like Paul wrote. Would, I mean, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be awesome to be able to tap into that? Grief is something that every one of us are going to face. Some, some of us are dealing with it right now. And, and we all know that our loved ones are not going to make it forever. Nobody makes it out alive. But yet every time we lose somebody, it, it cuts us to the core, doesn't it? It takes our breath away. We don't know how, how we're going to make it through. What if we had built this, I don't know what else to call it, it's a relationship, spending time with God, sitting with God, getting to know him. What if we actually had experienced before we face grief that God is close to the brokenhearted so that when we're brokenhearted, we don't have to go searching. We've already found him. He's already there. We can experience his goodness and his closeness when our world is falling apart. Paul said it made a difference because it does. This relationship with God is everything. At the end of his letter to the Philippians, the apostle Paul writes this, that I've, I wish if, if there was something in my life that I, I wish I could get a better grasp on, it would be what Paul writes. He says, not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. To me, that sounds like, oh, I want to be there so bad. How do you how do you be content? How do you be satisfied regardless of what's happening on the outside? I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret. I love that he uses those words, the secret of living in every situation. Whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, with a bigger house or not a bigger house, with a new car or an old car, with a dream job or without a job, with loved ones or without, I have learned the secret. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Paul says, is, listen, I can get through anything because I have a source of strength that isn't affected by circumstances and external effect. I can weather any storm because I have this source of comfort in me. I could face any challenge because the God of peace is with me. I can survive any situation that comes up because I am with God and he is with me and that makes a difference. It is, it, he calls it a secret, but it's not a secret. It's not hidden. It's what God offers us. It's the reason he sent his son, Jesus, so that you and I could have a relationship with him. And Paul says right here, he says, I can be good on the inside no matter what happens on the outside because of my relationship with God. And like, oh, I want that so bad. I've experienced that before several times in my life, these moments, but I just want to live there more often, you know? When, when it comes to surviving in the wild, getting the essentials is crucial, and it is no different when it comes to surviving our own hearts and minds and emotions and challenges. A relationship with God that Jesus makes possible is, again, the most crucial thing there is. And man, I just want to, I want to encourage every single one of us to not put it on the back burner, to not wait until a challenge comes up. I mean, he'll be there and he's ready all the time, but how much better prepared could we be if we covered the essentials first? If we, if we were just spending time with God changes everything, makes a difference. Spending time with him in prayer, spending time with him reading the Bible, spending time with him in relationships with other people like we talked about last week, all of these things, 
even just sitting with God where we don't have to say anything and he doesn't have to say anything. It's just this shared experience with him. And like, how, how much better? Just think about tomorrow when you wake up in the morning, how much better prepared do you think you might be if you just said, Father, I'm already feeling stressed. I know I've got this and this and this coming up. And I just don't know how much, Father, I need you to give me peace on the inside. And then we just sat with God and, Father, give me your peace. Share with, give, may you produce your peace in me. If we just started off the day that way. What about, okay, God, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm waking up tomorrow and like, I don't really have that many friends. I'm going to be lonely all day. I sit in an office or sit at my house. God, I want you to be close to me today. Okay, I know you are, but I need to experience your closeness. I want you to make a difference. You promised I would never be hungry or thirsty. Satisfy that need on the inside. What if we just sat with God and talked to him and built a relationship like that? Father, I'm, I'm feeling... I'm feeling worn out, feeling tired, feeling like I got, I got no strength left. God, I need you to give me strength. I need you to satisfy me in the inside. I mean, I think it would absolutely change everything. Jesus made it possible for us to get the most essential thing that we need when it comes to soul survival. So let's just lean into it. Let's enjoy, let's seek out, let's spend time with God and allow him to fulfill the needs, that longing inside us that we can't any other way. And so as we wrap up today, we've actually got a few minutes left in the service. I just want us to practice that. You know, we're just going to sit here for a couple minutes and I'll kind of give us some prompts, but we're just going to talk to God and kind of leave it open. Nobody has to say anything out loud, but for us to just communicate with God and, and begin to build that relationship with him for each one of us. So just get comfy. We'll take two or three minutes and let's just sit with God together. Father, for some of us, this is a, a very familiar thing. For others of us, maybe we're sweating a little bit or nervous or like, what is this? Father, right now, we just want to focus on you just want to experience you help us help us kind of calm down internally help us just kind of set our minds and our hearts on you you promise us something that every one of us need and we want it god we want what you have so graciously offered us a relationship with you Father, thank you for your love. In our hearts, just for a few seconds, we just want to thank you in our own words for the way in which you have loved us. Father, life isn't always easy. And there's some of us that we are facing a mountain in front of us emotionally with grief or sadness or worry. Feels like there's no way around it. God, I don't know how. I don't even know exactly what to ask for. But God, we want you to make a difference. Father, I give you permission to give me a new perspective, to change my heart, to help me to see beyond what seems overwhelming, what seems crushing. Help me to see that you are bigger than that.
Father, I want to ask you to help me seek you first. I know for me, I am always tricked and blinded by the lights of culture and external things. And yeah, just one more, newer, bigger, better, faster, stronger. Father, I, I don't want to fall into that trap again. I, I, I want you to become the source of my life, the source of my joy, the source of my peace. And so I just give you permission to become that in me. Protect our hearts, Father. Protect our minds from looking in other directions. From thinking that other things are more essential when it's really, it's just you. Father, I just ask as we as we get ready to kind of move on, may we not move on from your presence. Father, this to, to experience you doesn't need to be in a, a, a setting like this. We can be with you anytime, anywhere. When we put our trust in your son, Jesus, would you remind us of that often, God? Remind us that you are close and that you are near and that you want to be with us. May it May it become a, a habit, a practice, I don't know, whatever, in our lives to be with you. Help us be with you more. And Father, as we are with you, I don't know, just do your God thing in us. Change, transform, work, give us peace, all of those things as we build our relationship with you. We thank you in advance for what you want to do and what we want you to do in us as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.